This is practice test set six, paper 2H, so higher tier paper, calculator paper for the new maths GCSE from Edexcel. Uh, as usual, as I answer this, I'm not going to, going to give necessarily all of the possible ways of solving the problem. I'm just going to give the one that makes most sense to me as I'm looking at the question. So question one, the width of a rectangle is a whole number of centimeters. The length of the rectangle is nine centimeters longer than its width. The perimeter of the rectangle is less than 200 centimeters. Find the greatest possible width of the rectangle. So first thing here is that the width of the rectangle is a whole number of centimeters, which I'm going to call x. Quick sketch of the rectangle with width x and length nine centimeters longer than its width. So that's what my rectangle looks like with those dimensions. Perimeter of the rectangle is all of those four sides added together. And that altogether is less than 200 centimeters. So that's 4x plus 18 is less than 200. I'm going to subtract 18 from both sides, which leaves me with 4x is less than 182. I divide that by 4 to give x is less than 45.5. And because x is a whole number of centimeters in the question, x must be 45. That's its greatest possible width of the rectangle. So that's my answer there. Question two. A rugby team played six games. The mean score for the six games is 14.5. The rugby team played one more game, and the mean score for all seven games is 16. So this is going to be an adjusting the mean question. And with all of these, you always need to work out what the total, in this case, total number of points scored was. Um, we'll look at that for the first six games. So if the mean score is 14.5 for the first six games, that means that the total score divided by 6 is 14.5. So in order to find the total score for the first six games, total score equals 14.5 times 6. Which is 87. And then after the seventh game, got something over 7 is 16, because there are now seven games. So all seven games, total score equals 16 times by 7, which is 112. So in seventh game, I'll take away one total from the other. Hundred and twenty hundred and twelve minus eighty seven twenty five so twenty five points scored in the final game. Question three here are four containers. Water is poured into each container at a constant rate. Here are four graphs, and the graphs show how the depth of the water in each contain container changes with time. So looking at these four graphs. We have one that goes up at a constant rate with a straight line, and that's obviously going to go with uh, container 2. If I think about filling container 1, it's going to start filling. The depth is going to increase very quickly because it's got a smaller radius at the bottom. And as we go on, the, the depth will still increase, but it'll increase at a slower rate. So that's going to be a curve tailing off like that one going very quickly to begin with and then tailing off. This one will start filling fairly quickly because it's got a narrow radius and then slow down and then we'll speed up again. So 
we look for one that goes starts fairly quickly, slows down and speeds up. And this one starts slow, goes very quick in the middle, and then ends up going slower again. So that makes sense with the big radius there, small radius in the middle where the depth will increase quickly, and then a larger radius at the top. So that gives me match each graph with the correct container. A goes with that quick speed in the middle with 3. B and 1, uh, no, B and 2. C and 4. And D and 1. Question 4. The diagram shows the positions of three turbines A, B, and C. A is 6 kilometers due north of turbine B. C is 4.5 kilometers due west of turbine B. Calculate distance AC. Well, they've already marked in a right angle for us, so this is a straightforward Pythagoras' theorem question. So I know that AC squared, this length squared, is the sum of the squares of the other two sides. So 6 squared plus 4.5 squared. So that's 36 plus 20.25, which is 56.25. So AC is the square, that's AC squared. AC is the square root of that. So that's 7.5 kilometers. Calculate the bearing of C from A. Give your answer correct to the nearest degree. So firstly, C from A. That means I'm starting from A, and I need to know the bearing of C from A. Now the bearing of C from A is always going to be clockwise from north. So starting at A, I'm looking for this angle all the way here. Obviously, this bit is 180 degrees on the straight line, uh, but I don't need. Uh, I need to work this work this bit out. So for this, I need right angle triangle trigonometry. Um, I've got. I know the adjacent side to that angle, and I know the opposite side of that angle. So I know O and I know A, which means I'm going to use tan. So if I call this angle X tan x equals opposite over adjacent, 4.5 over 6. I could use this length here, 7.5, but seeing as these are given on the drawing and so definitely accurate, I'm just going to use the ones I'm given in the question. So x equals tan to the minus 1 of 4.5 over 6, which equals, on my calculator, Shift tan brackets 4.5 divided by 6 close brackets is 36.869897 keeps on going so I need to know the accuracy to which to give this it says give my answer correct to the nearest degree I have to add the 180 degrees and correct to the nearest degree is 37 to the nearest degree. Then I need to add the 180 degrees, so 180 plus 37 is 217. Question 5. The diagram shows a prism. All measurements are in centimetres. All corners are right angles. So it's as it looks. It's uh, sort of made up of three cuboids here. Find an expression in terms of x for the volume in centimetres cubed of the prism. You must show your working, give your answer in its simplest form. So I'm not being asked to solve for x. I'm just finding an expression for the volume. So I'm going to well, first of all, the volume is going to be this area, cross-sectional area, times by the length, which is x plus 1. So the first thing I need to work out is this cross-sectional area. 
I've got two large rectangles and one smaller rectangle. These are the same size, both x plus 2 by x. Um, and this rectangle in the middle, uh, I suppose if the bottom length is 4x minus 1, and I take away the two x's there and there, that leaves this with a length of 2x minus 1. Uh, this height is a bit more complicated. In fact, what I might do overall instead is, uh, rather than dividing it into 3, it'll work both ways, but rather than dividing it into 3, to work out all of that area of the whole rectangle, and then subtract this smaller rectangle, because that's going to give me some easier algebra to work with. So I'm going to use that method. I might come back and do the, the method I started with at the beginning. So whole rectangle. I've got x plus 2 times by 4x minus 1. Uh, uh, what should I can say? Subtracted rectangle. Is 2x tall by 2x minus 1. Uh, so if I expand those brackets, that's first 4x squared, first outsides, insides, last, outsides minus x, inside plus 8x, and lasts minus 1. This one, if I expand the brackets, is 2x times 2x is 4x squared, minus 2x. This equals 4x squared plus 7x minus 1. So the area of cross-section is 4x squared plus 7x minus 1 minus 4x squared minus 2x. And of course when I've got minus 4x squared minus 2x, that minus times a minus makes it a plus 2x in the end. So I've got 4x squared minus the 4x squared, that's 0x squared. And I've got 7x minus 1 plus 2x minus minus 2x plus 2x. So that is 9x minus 1. That's the area of the cross section, the U shape. So volume of prism is the, that cross sectional area, 9x minus 1, multiplied by the length, which is x plus 1, or the depth of the whole prism. So that's x plus 1. And again, first outside, inside, last, I've got 9x squared, outsides plus 9x, insides minus x, and minus 1. So that is 9x squared plus 8x minus 1. And that's my answer in its simplest form for the volume of the prism. I am just going to look and see what happened if I divided this into three rectangles. Each of these would have been x times by x plus 2, which is x squared plus 2x. And there are two lots of them, so that's 2x squared plus 4x. And then I have to add this middle section here. And this middle section is 2x minus 1 wide. And the height is x plus 2 minus 2x. So I've got x plus 2 minus 2x times by 2x minus 1. That gives me minus x, so x minus 2x is minus x plus 2, times by 2x minus 1, which is first minus 2x squared plus 4x, or do outsides, plus x plus 4x minus 2. 
if I add them together, so that's my two rectangles and that's my third rectangle, that will leave me with 2x squared minus 2x squared is 0. 4x plus 4x is 8x, 9x minus 2. And that's the same area there as I worked out before as... Oh, for some reason I've got 9x minus 1 down here. I wonder which one is correct. Ah, well, just as well I did it again, and as an exam method, it's a good idea to do two things in two different ways to check, because I've just spotted a mistake in my working here. When I expanded that double bracket, I should have got x, I should have got minus 2, and another minus 2 there, and that should be minus 2 there, so that when I do all of this, that's also a minus 2 there, minus 2 there, and it should have been 9x minus 2. So I get the same answer for both things, uh, which means that should be totally different from here. I'm going to cross out that answer. Expanding these brackets again, I've got 9x squared. Outsides is plus 9x. Insides, minus 2x. And then minus 2. So that is 9x squared plus 7x minus 2 as my final answer. And having done it both ways and finally ended up with the same thing both ways, I can be confident that that is the correct answer there. Question 6. The diagram shows a triangle DEF inside a rectangle ABCD. Show that the area of the triangle DEF is 8 centimeters squared. You must show where you're working. Well, in this case, I have got a a right angle here, so a right angle triangle here, and I've also got a right angle here with a right angle triangle here. What I could do is try and work out the area of the triangle itself, but in fact what's going to be easier is if I can work out the length of the rectangle and then subtract this smaller triangle, this smaller triangle, and this smaller triangle from the rectangle, then that will leave me with the area of the square. No, oh, sorry, the area of the triangle, which is what I need to show here. So it's a rectangle so that those two centimeters, two lots of two centimeters add to four centimeters there. In order to find the length CD, I'm going to have to use Pythagoras' theorem again. So I can say that this squared minus this squared is that squared. CD squared equals 2 root 10 all squared minus 2 squared. So hypotenuse squared minus the other side squared. 2 root 10 all squared is 40. So that is 36. CD squared is 36. So therefore CD equals 6, the square root of 36. So that's 6 centimeters, which means the other side must be 6 centimeters, and that is 4 centimeters in there. So area rectangle, area of rectangle, 6 by 4, 24. Let's call these 1, 2, and 3. These three triangles, triangle 1 half base times height is half times 6 times 2, half times the base times the height, which is 6. Triangle 2 is half base times height, which is 2. And triangle 3 half base times height. So that is 8. Area of remaining triangle which is triangle DEF 
which is what we've been asked to find, is 24 minus 6 minus 2 minus 8. 24 minus 6 minus 2 minus 8 is 8, which is what we were asked to show. Question 7. Jarek uses the formula area equals, area equals half AB sine C to work out the area of a triangle. For this triangle, A equals 7.8 centimeters, correct to the nearest millimeter, B equals 5.2 centimeters, correct to the nearest millimeter, and C equals 63 degrees, correct to the nearest degree. Calculate the lower bound for the area of the triangle. Well, if this is correct to the nearest millimeter, if I just sketch the triangle, we've got side A, side B, and angle C. And we're looking for the lower bound for the area of the triangle. That's obviously going to occur when this is as small as possible, this is as small as possible, and also with the smallest possible angle, although I would want to test that to make sure that I'm not making a silly mistake about the angles. So lower bound of this measurement 7.8 centimeters to the nearest millimeter means 7.75 centimeters would round up to 7.8 uh, 5.2 centimeters lower bound is 5.15 centimeters and correct in the nearest degree lower bound is 62.5 area equals half times lower bound for A times lower bound for B times sine 62.5 if I put that into my calculator sine 62.5 times by 5.15 times by 7.75 equals 35.4 divided by 2 is 17.7014094 and I'm just going to check what happens with the upper bound of this to make sure I'm not making a mistake with that so I also work it out with sine of 63.5 and put this in brackets so if I did it with sine 63.5 instead I'm just doing that calculation again I end up with so with sine 63.5 is 17.8595 and of course that is bigger than the other one because if you've got a bigger angle then there would be a bigger area of the triangle but um, just to be sure I've just done that check so that hasn't improved my answer this is the lower bound of the area and that is the correct answer here Question 8. The scatter graph shows some information about 10 cars. It shows the time in seconds it takes each car to go from 0 miles per hour to 60 miles per hour. For each car, it also shows the maximum speed in miles per hour. So 0 to 60 speed along here, time in seconds, 0 to 60, and its maximum speed in miles per hour. What type of correlation does this scatter graph show? Well, it shows that it's a, it's a downwards sloping line, if there was a line of best fit though. So that is a negative correlation. And that means that uh, greater, acceler greater acceleration, which is here, also goes with greater maximum speed. Greater acceleration meaning it takes less time to do 0 to 60.
Although I don't think that's going to be required for this one mark answer. I shouldn't put greater acceleration time, I should put faster acceleration time. Goes with greater max speed. The time a car takes to go from 0 to 60 is 11 seconds. Estimate the maximum speed for this car. So there's a fairly strong correlation here and I can draw a line of best fit through the points. So in order to do that I need to get a general idea of the direction the points go in, which is that. And then I'm going to draw a line that doesn't have to go through any of the points, but should be roughly in the middle of all of them. Um, going to do that and move it down a bit. So you can do this with a ruler in your exam. That has one, two, three, four, five, lots of points above and not many points below. If I move it here, they're well below, but maybe that's uh, closer to the line of best fit because many of them are on that line itself. So I'm um, about there. It's going to be my estimate for that. I'll put a comment below if that's incorrect. Um, 11 seconds. So read off 11 seconds from your graph. And that is 120 miles per hour max speed. Question 9. Alex and Ben go to a cafe with some friends. Alex buys four cups of coffee and three cups of tea and pays a total of 695. This looks like it's going to be a simultaneous equation question. And it is because Ben buys five cups of coffee and two cups of tea and pays a total of 720. Work out the cost of each cup of coffee and the cost of each cup of tea. So we've got four cups of coffee and three cups of tea costing 695. And we've got five cups of coffee and two cups of tea costing £7.20. In order to use the elimination method I need to have the same number of either C or T. So I'm going to multiply this first one by 2. Multiplying everything on both sides by 2. 8C plus 6T equals 2 lots of 695. It's £13.90. And I'm going to multiply this second equation by 3. giving me 15c plus 6t, so that I've got the same amount of t's here, equals 720 times 3, which is £21.60. Uh, I'm actually just going to write out that this top one underneath this so that I can do an easy subtraction to get rid of the 6t. So 8c plus 6t equals £13.90. I'm going to subtract at this stage. 15c minus 8c gives me 7c, 0t, 21.60 minus 13.90 is £7.70. So c equals £1.10, dividing both sides by 11 there. Sorry, not by 11, dividing by 7 and getting 11. So C is £1.10. Go back to the original equation here. 4 times £1.10 plus 3T equals 6.95. Minus that £4.40 from both sides. 3T equals... So, minus £4.40 on both sides. 6.95 minus £4.40 is 2.55. Divide both sides by 3. 
is 0.85. So cup of coffee, one pound ten, and cup of tea, 0 pounds eighty-five. But of course, I also want to check that I've got my answers correct. So if I've got them correct, they should also work in this equation here. So this second one, check. 5 times the cup of coffee plus 2 times the cup of tea. 5 times pound ten plus 2 times 0.85 is £7.20, which is what it is in the question as well. So I've done it correctly. Always worth checking any equations questions because they're guaranteed marks if you if you've got them right and you can check them in the exam. Question 10. Interesting looking graph we've got here. Which is either part of a very lo large quadratic but much more likely an exponential function. Which it is. The graph of y equals k to the power of x, where k is a positive constant, which that just means k is a positive number, whole number that stays the same, is shown above. Find the value of k. Well, the one point that is for sure but doesn't give us any help is this point when x equals 0, y equals 1. That tells us that k to the power of 0 equals 1, which we know anyway. But other clear points that are on this graph are this point here, minus 1, 2, and this point here, minus 2, 4, and also this one here, minus 3, 8. That tells me that when x equals minus 1, k to the power of minus 1, k to the power of x, equals 2 at that point. And when x equals minus 2, k to the power of minus 2 equals 4. So I'm looking for something that when I put it to the power of minus 1 equals 2, I put it to the power of minus 2, it equals 4. k to the power of minus 1 is the same as 1 over k. k to the power of minus 2 is the same as 1 over k squared. 1 over k equals 2, 1 over k squared equals 4. If 1 over k equals 2, then k must equal 1 over 2, as in I've divided both sides by 2, multiplied both sides by k. k equals a half. Does that work here? 1 divided by a half square, squared. 1 over 1 half all squared. You'll find that that's 1 divided by a quarter, which is the same as 4. So you could do that on your calculator, 0 0.5 squared. It's 0.25. 1 divided by the answer of that is 4. So k equals a half is the solution to that one. And that will also work for that third value. A half to the power of minus 3 will also equal 8. Question 11. In the USA, Sam pays 28.88 US dollars for 6 US gallons of petrol. In Russia, Leon pays 800 rubles for 25.58 litres of petrol. Use the information in the table to compare the prices of petrol in the two countries. So this is the table. 1 US gallon is 3.79 litres. 1 euro is 40.63 rubles. 1 US dollar is 0.77 euros. Uh, let's get this into, it. we have to make a decision of converting everything to the same unit so that we can compare. Let's uh, work out, uh, let's say, dollars per, dollars per litre. That means we've got to do a bit of conversion for both of them. So 20.88 US dollars. for six gallons. Let's divide that by six. 20.88 divided by six. That is 3.48 US dollars for one gallon. And one gallon is 3.79 liters, so 
if I divide that by 3.79, I'll have dollars per litre. So 3.48 divided by 3.79 is 0.9182, roughly, US dollars per litre. So I've taken it from six gallons to one gallon, and then one gallon to one litre. And then looking at the Russian version, I've got 800 rubles, 25.58 litres of petrol. So I can work this out per litre, divide by 25.58. 800 divided by 25.58 is 31.274 rubles per liter. And I want to know how many dollars that is per liter so I can compare. And I've now got to convert between Euro rubles to euros and then dollars to euros. So. Divide that by 40.63 will give me euros per litre. So I've still got that number 31.274 in my calculator. Divide it by 40.63. That gives me 0 0.7697 dot 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 euros per litre. And if one dollar is the same as 0 0.77 euros, 0 0.7697 euros per litre, in order to convert from euros into dollars, I'm going to have to divide by 0 0.77. So I've still got this number stored on my calculator. Divide that by 0 0.77. That gives me 0 0.999659 US dollars per litre. And it asks for me to compare it, and that means it wants a written statement. So this is USA, and this is Russia. And I can say price of petrol is similar in the two countries. but slightly more expensive in Russia. That's 0.99 dollars per liter is greater than Naught point naught point nine one eight dollars per liter. So I've shown that I've made my comparison there and I put it into words, so that should mean I get the communication marks as well as all the calculation marks there. Question twelve is clearly a probability question with a probability tree diagram. Louise makes a spinner. The spinner can land on green or on red. The probability that the spinner will land on green is 0 0.7, and Louise spins the spinner twice. Complete the probability tree diagram. So first spin, 0 0.7. On the branches, always has to add to 1, so that's 0 0.3. Um, if it's always 0 0.7 on green, which it is in the question, then it'll always be 0 0.3, probability of 0 0.3 that it lands on red. Work out the probability that the spinner, spinner lands on two different colors. Well, that can happen in two different ways. It can either go green-red, or it can go red-green. So I need to calculate the probability of both of these along the branches. So that's 0.7 times 0.3. Remember to multiply along the branches. And that's 0.3 times 0.7. So that's 0.21 and 0.21. And add them together. 0.21 plus 0.21 equals 0.42. That's the probability 
green red or red green the other options would be red red which would be the same color or green green which would be the same color so neither of those count so 0.42 is my answer Question 13. A trapezium ABCD has an area of 5 root 6 centimetres squared. AB is 4 centimetres, BC is root 3 centimetres, and D DC is K centimetres. Calculate the value of K, giving your answer in the form A root B minus C, where A, B, and C are positive integers. Show each step in your working. Well, I'm not going to worry too much about this form yet. I just know that there's going to be some surd in my answer. But at the moment, uh, area of a trapezium is given by adding the two opposite sides and dividing by two, so effectively finding the average of the two opposite sides. That is 4 plus k, 4 plus k, all over 2, times by the height, root 3 and that equals the area of the trapezium which is 5 root 6 centimeters squared and we need to find the value of k so if I expand that bracket first of all that's 4 root 3 plus k root 3 all over 2 I've just multiplied the top two by root 3 the numerator equals 5 root 6 times both sides by 10 not by 10, sorry, by 2. Multiply it by the denominator to get rid of that denominator. 4 root 3 plus k root 3 equals 10 root 6. 5 root 6 times 2 is 10 root 6. I'm then going to subtract 4 root 3 from both sides. So that leaves me with k root 3 on this side equals 10 root 6 minus 4 root 3 and then to get k on its own I need to divide both sides by root 3 leaving me with k on this side equals 10 root 6 over root 3 minus 4 root 3 over root 3 which is just well it's just going to be minus 4 I'll write it out in full at the moment So equals 10 root 6 over root 3 minus 4. And now I can rewrite this as 10 lots of root 6 over root 3 minus 4, which is 10 lots of, using the rules of thirds, root 6 over 3 minus 4. 6 over 3 is the same as 2, so that is 10 root 2 minus 4. That's my answer for k, uh, and it's now in the form of something times by the square root of something else minus a third number, where all of them are integers, 10 root 2 minus 4. Question 14. The diagram shows a large tin of pet food in the shape of a cil cylinder. The large tin has a radius of 6.5 centimeters and a height of 11.5 centimeters. A pet food company wants to make a new size of tin. The new tin will have a radius of 5.8 centimeters. I'm just going to draw this new tin. 5.8 centimeters. And it will have the same volume as the large tin. Cal give the height of the new tin and give your answer correct to one decimal place. So let's work out the volume of original tin. Is pi r squared times by the height, which is, so that's the area of that, pi r squared times by the height of the cylinder. It is just a prism, uh, so it's the surface area of the base times by the, the length of the prism. So that's pi times by 6.5 squared times by 11.5. I'm just going to leave it in terms of pi because the next one is also going to be in terms of pi. So 6.5 squared times by 11.5 gives me 485.875 times by pi. You could multiply it by pi, that would be fine. It just gives you a, 
obviously a much more complicated answer because pi is infinite um, in its number of decimal, decimal places. So vol of Newton equals pi r squared times h again. So pi times 5.8 squared times by h, which equals 5.8 squared is 33.64 pi h. And these two things are equal because it tells us that it has the same volume as the large tin. So that tells me that 485.875 pi equals 33.64 pi h. And I'm trying to find h. So let's divide both sides by pi first of all, get rid of it. That tells me that 485.875 equals 33.64 h. And now I can get h on its own by dividing by 33.64 on both sides 485.875 divided by 33.64 is 14.443370 and again I'm going to write it out to lots of decimal places and carries on and then make sure that I give my final answer to the degree of accuracy that's asked for in the question correct to one decimal place so h equals 14.4 centimeters. And then I'm going to go back to the question and check that that makes some sort of sense. So h is 14.4, that will be taller than this one. And that makes sense because the radius is smaller than this one. So if they've got the same volume, obviously a smaller radius will need a taller can. Question 15, prove that for all positive values of n, n plus 2 squared minus n plus 1 squared over 2n squared plus 3n equals 1 over n. It's saying all positive values of n. To begin with, let's just look at the algebra here and show that. So I'm going to start off with my left-hand side here. And hopefully it will follow through to something that ends up with 1 over n. So... I'm going to expand the brackets at the top. I can't factorize the top as it is because um, I've got different factors in each bracket. But if I expand the brackets, I might find something that will factorize. So first of all, that's n plus 2 times n plus 2 minus n plus 1 times n plus 1. As soon as I got the minus sign in there, I know I'm going to have to watch out as I expand these brackets. And down here, I'm going to factorize already. That is n times 2n plus 3 just the way these questions work, I can see that if I'm trying to get from a denominator of n times 2n plus 3 to a denominator of n, I would expect there to be some factor of 2n plus 3 at the top. So I'm going to expand those brackets. That is n squared plus 2n plus 2n is plus 4n plus 2 times 2 is plus 4 minus, and I'm going to put this whole locked in brackets, n squared plus 2n plus n plus n plus 1 all over n times 2n plus 3 which equals n squared plus 4n plus 4 and I'm just doing this stage by stage because it's so easy to make mistakes with the minus sign here that minus sign carries right the way across that bracket n times 2n plus 3 and when I collect like terms here, n squared minus n squared is 0, 4n minus 2n is 2n, and 4 minus 1 is 3. And as expected, the 2n plus 3s will cancel, leaving us with 1 over n. So that's shown that that works. Uh, for all positive values of n, I don't know that we need to add an extra statement there. Any value of n is going to give us a positive answer here. So I think it's just the fact that this is, I think I can just state at the end 
when n is positive to match the question. Question 16, make r the subject of the formula p equals 2r plus 5 over r minus 3. This is one of those situations where the thing we want to make the subject appears twice in the question, in the formula. That is going to need factorizing. So this is a more complicated rearranging of formula than you sometimes see. So I'm going to start off by multiplying both sides by the denominator. So that is p times r minus 3 equals 2r plus 5. Expand this bracket, pr minus 3p equals 2r plus 5. And now if I want to get the r on its own, I first of all need to get all of the r's on the same side. So I'm going to subtract 2r from both sides. That's pr minus 2r minus 3p equals 5. And then I'm going to add 3p so that I only have things involving r on the uh, left-hand side. So plus 3p to both sides, that gives me pr minus 2r equals 5 plus 3p. This is the key stage here. I now need to factorize this expression. r times by p minus 2 equals 5 plus 3p. And now I've only got one instance of r in my formula. So by collecting them and factorizing them, I now only have one in instance of r in that formula. Divide both sides by p minus 2. And that leaves me with r equals 5 plus 3p over p minus 2, which I can't simplify. And just as I had two r's in the question, I've got two p's in the answer. That's what I would expect. 5 plus 3p over p minus 2. You may get an answer that looks slightly different to that if you had, for example, uh, th minus 5 minus 3p over 2 minus p or something like that, something where the minus signs have, have changed around. It depends on the order in which you do the question. Um, but you may get something that's equal to that that's also an acceptable answer. Question 17. Transformations of functions. The graph of y equals f of x is shown on the grid. The graph g is a translation, so it's just been moved across. Translation of the graph y equals f of x. Uh, and so f of x has this peak at minus 4 and 3 up. This one has its peak at 1 and 3 up. So it, the graph has gone from f to g by moving across 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 squares. 5 to the right. That means that because it's moving left to right in the x direction, it's the opposite sign of what you would expect. So rather than plus 5, it goes in the brackets. So it's f of x, and instead of plus 5, it's minus 5. So the fact that it's in the brackets x, uh, means that it's affecting its x direction, left or right. And because it's in the brackets, it's the negative of what you'd expect. The graph of y equals f of x has a maximum point at minus 4, 3. This is the point here. Write down the coordinates of the maximum, the po maximum point of the graph y equals f of minus x. Well, f of minus x is a translation, but well, so no, it's a reflection in the x direction. So it will flip it across the axes. So if this goes from minus 4, 3, f of minus x it will be reflected the entire graph. It'll look something roughly like that, roughly like that, with a mi maximum at the reflected point there of 4, 3. The y value won't change at all. Question 18. A parachutist jumps out of a plane. This graph shows information about the velocity v meters per second of the parachutist t seconds after he jumped. Work out an estimate for the acceleration of the parachutist when t equals 8. So on a velocity time graph, we've got velocity time. Acceleration is the gradient of the graph, the change, the rate of change of speed, or the rate of change of velocity over time. And we're asked to find this when t equals 8. 
So I'm going to draw in what I estimate to be the gradient of the graph at that point. Shallower than that, I think it's about there. Um, but it needs to be in the right place to check that that really works. I think the gradient might be a bit shallower than that, in fact, so I'm going to rotate that a little bit and move it to the right place. Nope, that's gone too far. It is an estimate, this, and they won't expect you to do it too accurately. Um, that seems to leave about the same sort of angle on each side of the graph, so I'm going to say that that's the estimated gradient and then of course I have to calculate the gradient of that point so I look for key points on the line that's on the line and crosses the grid at a certain point and so does that there so I'm going to say oh and so does the point actually on the line itself so that is 51 and 8 t equals 8 at that point so gradient equals change in y over change in x so change in y I've got 51 going down to let's say that's 45 51 minus 45 over change in x is 8 down to 4 here so as long as I'm using the same points on the graph and doing them in the correct order then my gradient should come out correctly so that is uh, 6 over 4 which is 3 over 2 1.5 meters per second squared positive and a positive gradient so that should be the correct answer there B, work out an estimate for the distance the parachutist falls in the first six seconds. So distance travelled is the area under a the area under a velocity time graph or a speed time graph is distance travelled. So in the first six seconds, I'm just going to use three trapezia here. Uh, equal strips always use equal strips, so I'm going to divide it into these three equal strips. This one's going to be a triangle, this one's going to be a trapezium, and this one's going to be a trapezium. And then I use my values, I've got the height of that is uh, 46, so three trapezia, let's just call them A, B, and C. A is 46 plus whatever this distance is, uh, 35 over 2, times by the height of the trapezium, which is 2, or it's, I suppose it's the width of the trapezium in this case, but normally when we use the formula we talk about the height. Uh, B, we've got the same distance here, 35, plus smaller distance here of, well, that's around 20, I'm going to use 20 there, over 2 times 2 and area of C is half base times height, so half base times by the height of 20 again. So area A is 81, uh, 35 plus 20, that's 55, divided by 2 times by 2, leaves it at 55 and that is half times 2 is 1 times 20 is 20 so total area equals 156 if I add all of those together 101 plus 55 so that's 156 meters question 19 s is inversely proportional to the cube of t 
So translate this, first of all, as with all proportion questions, into the statement. S is inversely proportional. S is inversely proportional to the cube of t. That's what it looks like. That means that S equals some constant value over t cubed. Or some constant value times by 1 over t cubed. It's the same thing. In the end. And I know that when t equals 4, s equals a half. So put that into my formula. 1 half equals k over 4 cubed. So a half times 4 cubed equals k, which equals 32. So my formula that links s and t is s equals 32 over t cubed. Find the value of s when t equals 8. s equals 32 over 8 cubed. s equals 32 over 512, which equals 0 0.0625. Question 20. The line n is drawn below. Find an equation of the line perpendicular to n that passes through the point 0, 1. Passes through this point here. Now, on this axis, I'd first of all, to take a look at how the scale is marked, the scale is even on both axes, as in each square is one unit on each axis, as it's labelled. That tells me that the gradient of this line is... Well, for every one across, it goes up 3, so... Gradient of n equals 3. Um, perpendicular to that has gradient of minus 1 third. Negative reciprocal. So perpendicular lines, the gradients will have the negative reciprocal, 1 over whatever the gradient is, times by minus 1. And it needs to go through the point 0, 1. Gradient of, a th of negative a third means that for every 1 across, I go up a third, and I'm working backwards here because it's negative, which means for every 3 squares across, I go up 1. So if I mark some points on this line, And I can connect those points with a straight line. And all I need to do now is say that, well, if the line is y equals mx plus c, I know the gradient already, and I know the y-intercept because it's here. It was already given to me in the question. So in fact, I didn't need to draw that line at all. I didn't need to mark that gradient. The All I need to do is put my gradient minus one-third x plus 1, the y-intercept here. And that's my answer there. Question 21. The points A, B, and C lie in order on a straight line. Coordinates of A are 2, 5. I'm just going to do a sketch of this. 2, 5 is A. Coordinates of B are 4, P, so twice along over here. And the coordinates of C are Q17. So A, I've got 2, 5. B, I've got 4, P. And C, I've got Q17. It says, given that AC, that length, is 4 times AB, find the, length, find the values of P and Q. So if I look at purely the x direction here, and I know that these are on a straight line, remember, they're all on a straight line together. The x direction, to get from a to b, I've gone an increase of 2 in the x direction. And if ac is 4 lots of ab, then that must be 8 to go from there to the, to the end of c. ac is 4 times ab. So break it into the x directions and the y directions. So that tells me if it's gone up 2 there and it's gone up 8 there, Q must be 10 then. 
so q equals 10. And then if I look at the y direction, to get from point A to point C, it's gone up from 5 to 17, it's gone up 12. And that's four times the distance of A to B. So the distance from A to B must have been 3. So 5 plus 3 is 8. So P equals 8. Useful to have a drawing there and label the drawing and think about just breaking it down into X direction and Y direction. And that is the end of that paper. If there are any corrections or anything, I will put them below or any useful links.